Welcome to Finely Tuned. In each episode here, we're speaking with people who care about our built environment. This podcast is built by Gridium. Hello, and thanks for tuning in on this conversation of cybersecurity in the built environment and the anatomy of a BMS hack with Fred Gordy from Intelligent Buildings. This is Millen with Gridium. Yes, thank you, Millen. First, let me uh, thank you guys for allowing me the opportunity to speak on a subject that I'm very passionate about, and I appreciate you guys. Before we get started, I want to kind of tell you a little bit about also the company that I'm working with, which is Intelligent Buildings. And um, now at its core, Intelligent Buildings is a, uh, a company that works for the customer, and the reason that customers come to them is, as you can imagine, there's so many disparate systems out there, uh, parking, uh, control systems. It's not just about control systems. It's about the entire smart building strategy. Mm-hmm. We can step in the gap, be the advocate for the customer, take the disparate systems, pick and choose and help them, guide them through the process of putting together the best smart building package they can come up with. And as part of that, it would be remiss that cybersecurity was not part of its core foundational piece. And everything that intelligent building does is built on that layer of cybersecurity. I came from IT in 2000 and I moved over to the building control space uh, to the smart building world in 2000. And I remember getting a call from this company uh, at the time and they explained what it was that they did, and I still didn't get it. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I went to the interview, and uh, they started talking about web-based control for buildings and uh, that type of thing. And I did something at an interview you probably shouldn't do. I looked at them and I said, are you sure you got the right guy? Mm. And uh, the, uh, the gentleman that was interviewing me, he said, yes, we do. And the reason is is because we're, we know that these systems are – are moving more and more to uh, a global control kind of strategy. And we need people that have IT backgrounds to kind of help us move into that world. And uh, thus began the the transition. Uh, That company introduced me to um, enterprise level building control systems with people like AT&T and Macy. And uh, the the security through obscurity thing kind of basically I drank the Kool-Aid, let's just say it, because I went from a policy control world to the wild, wild west. And I guess it was around about 2010 that I, you know, looking at the portfolio of who we were integrating with and what all could possibly be done, I I had to kind of shake off the Kool-Aid that I drank and and start saying, you know, we really need to start taking a look at this stuff. And, uh, trying to figure out a way to protect it because in and of itself it's not the design it's not designed to protect itself. Sure. And so I started my journey of cybersecurity for control systems and I found that while there were entities like ICS data and that kind of thing. Yeah, Fred, thanks for telling us a little bit about your transition from the IT world to the OT world and, and let's jump into what a BMS hack might look like. So I think um, I think what you've got showing here on the slide is this question of uh, is your building's data searchable and, and can you tell us a little bit about what kind of data is uh, searchable and, and where? Sure. Uh, a few years ago, there was a gentleman by the name of John Matherly who uh, created Shodan. And Shodan in and of itself is not a hacker tool by uh, its definition. Okay. However, that's what it's become. And what it does is um, it's running a series of queries 24-7, 365, and it's looking for exposed devices, and it's looking specifically for OT devices. It's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not looking just for servers and that kind of thing. It's looking for things like control systems, cameras, so on and so forth. And it catalogs those, and it's searchable to the point that you can not only put in the uh, the name of, a, say, a particular manufacturer, but you can also find out where its geoloc is, which is the IP location of where it's originating from. So you you get uh, some background on what what's actually in the building, uh, a little bit about, you know, the manufacturer. And there's a lot of relative information there that is kind of tasty to the bad guy. But again, he didn't design this for the purpose of bad. It was uh, 
you know, his his attempt to, you know, kind of bring awareness to this. And as a result, there's a uh, census is another indexer or OT search engine. Uh, this one was created by a university. I, I'm actively I actively use both of these. Now the third one is a a sketchy one. It's called Zoomai. And as far as I understand it, its its origin is in China. And uh, but it's you know it's available for anybody to use. So so once once you have access to these these search engines, like I said, you can put in a, a manufacturer name. You can put in a, even something like a chiller, and it'll bring back exposed chillers. Now let me qualify what I mean by exposed. What this means is there is a public IP address that this any one of these systems is actually registered a response back from. What that says is. It's not behind a firewall, which is a huge no-no. But uh, to give you some uh, stats and stuff, if you were to do what I call a call all for census, and it would give you back somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 million connected devices in the world. Wow. In the United States, yeah. In the United States, there's over 6 million. So we've got a lot of work to do. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, like uh, with the... With Shodan, you just sign up for a free account. Now they 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 do charge for a little extra thing. Census is all free. Zuma is all free, and anybody and everybody can use them. In fact, so. I did sign up for Shodan myself, and I was able to pull up a chiller at a private university in Southern California. It was quite remarkable. It it can be addictive. <laughs> I mean, it really can. I mean, if yeah. you, uh, uh, and and let me ask you a question: Is how long did it take you to do that? Seven minutes, maybe. So that gives you that in seven minutes' time, you found a a chiller at a university. Now we don't know what it was attached to, and I mean sure. we could dig and find out. But the reality is that's a chiller. A chiller is a large piece of equipment, even if it's nothing more than just to damage it physically, where it would have cost the university a lot of money to fix. And you did that in seven minutes. You connected with it in seven minutes. Yep. Now, what you see here is just a basic uh, layout of a control network, and the red circles indicate that somebody has put a public IP address into each one of these devices, meaning that Shodan, Census, or Zoomai could find it. Um, now, over to the right, there's a generator. Um, usually, if you find a generator, it's attached to something critical, a hospital, a data center, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So just by the nature of what it is, if I'm a bad guy and I find generators, you know that's that's a, a that's a great find. That's an easy find. Now the interesting thing to me is, if you look down the the, uh, the tree, so to speak, if you don't know what a crack unit is, it's a computer room air conditioning unit, and these are usually found inside a data center, and their whole sole purpose is to keep the server floor cool. Mm -hmm. Well, as a bad guy, if I can get to those and I can raise the set points on those dramatically enough, uh, the servers are not going to be able to keep up. And what will happen is servers will begin to start tripping offline. That can interrupt e-commerce. You know, the same thing uh, you got if down through that little tree. You have uh, a UPS, a PDU, a UPS, you know, as, as most of us know what those are, the little ones sit on the desk. These are big guys that sit in data centers. And the PDU is just a power distribution unit. You can find all of these things through these uh, search engines, and like I say, just based on the equipment type itself, it will tell you what its criticality level is, because if you're not putting a UPS on something you don't care about. You're putting it on something you do care about. Yeah, and with this information exposed, you know, how does a, a hacker or, or an attacker take it uh, one level down? What I'm showing is a schematic of a backnet backnet attack and this is something that I've kind of really started harping on lately is um, backnet by its nature when it was originally developed was to be an open protocol meaning that anybody could talk to it now it's good in our control world because then we were getting away from proprietary systems well there is no username or password required to get into a backnet backnet network mm -hmm. before uh, you know, say two years before ago, before anybody really started thinking bad guy way about getting in control networks, you had to crack a password. And the reality is the control system passwords are not that hard to crack. So, but it still, it slowed you down. 
but once the um, once it got out there, it's a BBMD, which is a Backnet Broadcast Management Device, and its whole uh, purpose in life is to help controllers from one subnet talk to controllers on another subnet. And so, if I can find one of these BBMDs through Showdown or Census or whatever, I now can traverse down through the connected backnet network. So a bad guy finds on Shodan or Census and he looks up BBMD. I mean, it's that simple. You can type BBMD. Mm -hmm. If it finds it, it'll tell you in the descriptions that it's a router. And if it tells you it's a router, that means that there's attached things to it. So what the bad guy would do here, oh, if you look on the left side, you have basically human control. There's comfort, uh, HVAC. On the right side might be representative of a data center. Well, if I can get to the left BBMD, which is shown in the red circle, and then I use a tool that we're fix I'm fixing to show you in just a second, you can then scan the network and find the cracks, the UPSs and the gen sets, and then you can do real damage. So now, once you've got that BBMD, there's free tools out there for anybody to download. And this is one that I've found on SourceForge. And the scary thing about this one is I've seen other free tools, and they'll let you scan the network, and you can do uh, basic functionality. But with this particular tool, I can do everything. I mean, it's, it's to the point that I can even turn controllers into bricks. And what I mean by that is I can, I can pump a program in there that will just basically wreck what's there, and they may be able to recover it, <laughs> but how long will it take? Looking at this screen here, what you see is, this is, uh, what I did was I found one BBMD, and uh, this one is not the big list like I got, but one BBMD, and when I scanned the network, I, could, I found over 200 and something BACnet IP devices, and then underneath them are BACnet MSTP, or serially connected devices. Let me see if so I got this straight, Fred. Does this allow you okay. to make changes? Yes, it does. In fact, to the point, if you're looking over there on the uh, uh, right side of that screen, it shows the editable properties. Even if the programmer or operator has set this thing to read only, with this tool, I can go in and make it writable. And I can change set points. I can change uh, alarm parameters where, you know, kind of you and I talked one time about the Stutznet mm -hmm. uh, uh, attack. Well, the Stutznet attack masked itself so nobody would see what was going on. With this tool, I can do the same thing. I can turn your alarms off before I do anything, and you won't receive any alarms while I'm in there <clears throat> making set point changes, turn, right. literally turning devices off. I can, you can even, like a, using the central plan of the chiller, you can go in with this, this particular software, and you can lock out the operator. In other words, I can manually override it to where he can't get into it without actually going and downloading the program or connecting directly to the device and having to jump through several hoops to take back control. But by the time he is able to do that, I've done, you know, I've wrecked the place, yeah. basically. <clears throat> so, and you can set schedule, uh, read uh, the trend logs that have been there. But again, the main point that I'm making is no, no username or password password was required to get to this level because of the because of backnet is open wow so there's more online than we know you've made that point quite well fred that's that's crystal clear and when i first cottoned on to a little bit of this i was quite surprised um fred and as i dug in i realized there was a much more to know here than it first meets the eye um You've made a point in some of your material that I've read that there are people involved in these PMS attacks, uh, you know, as well. And can you talk a little bit about the role that, that people have um, in in the building controls and, and how attacks can take place? And first off, cybersecurity, regardless of its IT or OT, um, all the countermeasures in the world are never going to circumvent a, 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 an operator's neglect. Operator neglect is going to uh, is going to override any kind of 
security measures that you have in place. So it's really important that everybody consider themselves a part of, the, uh, not necessarily a part of IT, but a uh, part of the cybersecurity team. And that goes from, you know, the guys that run in the building to the, the security guards up front, anybody working in admin. And if I may interject, um, using the term, and I'm <laughs> not trying to pick on admin, but um, there's been a lot of talk about a particular breach that everybody knows about, and it's called about Target's breach. Mm -hmm. And it was originally reported that attack came through the HVAC system. That wasn't exactly true because what happened was there's an HVAC contra contractor, not unlike the one I used to work for, but they were up in the Northeast. Mechanical contractors, it's not unusual for them to have a portal into the people that they serve in order for the admins to enter bills. So in other words, a service guy goes on site at the Target store, he does a repair, he comes back and he hands the work order in to the people in, in, in admin, and they open a, opened a Target portal and went in and entered the, uh, the billing information. Mm -hmm. Well, what happened here was they, this particular admin got fished, and fished, P-H-I-S-I, -S -I, I mean, excuse me, P-H-I-S-H, means emails are sent out, and hopefully you click something. It's like there's a hook inside the email, and if you click it, it's going to do something. Yep. And in this particular case, it, it uh, launched key loggers onto the uh, system. And the admins, and this is not a not an unusual practice either, all of the admins had the same username and password for Target. There was only one username and password for several admins. So it could have been any one of them. But once the bad guys found out, you know, or got into their system, then they saw, well, wait a minute, we're, we're on the Target network. We see that there's a Target network. They got on the target network, and then they, the network they were on, the, the POS, the point-of-sale devices, were not segmented from this ERP system, and the bad guys were able to just run rampant across all the credit card machines inside mm -hmm. the system. Yeah. So no amount of uh, firewalls or anything could catch that. That comes down to people. We all have to do our job. And the, the days when we thought, well, who cares, or you know, that kind of thing. They're pretty much over. The example that I have here is something new. They had a control system sitting there, and there's a uh, ransomware called Server 3. And, and can you, you explain know, what ransomware is? Sure, absolutely. Ransomware is a really nasty thing because what it does is when it gets launched onto your network, it encrypts everything. The data is still there. But well, what they've done is they basically padlocked all of your um, your data, all your functionality, and you have to pay them to get the keys to unlock it. So <clears throat> the the mm -hmm. thing about ransomware, and this is where I'm always kind of a little hesitant when somebody tells me, "Well, we got it fixed." Well, you never know what they these guys leave behind. Even if you pay them, and they come and and they will, they'll unlock your data. What did they leave? Nobody knows unless you really dig through the system. But anyway, so that's what ransomware is. It okay. basically holds you hostage until you pay them. Now, the unique thing about ransomware, uh, and I, I mean, I hate to get into too many little rabbit trails here, but no, that's all right. This little, is interesting. Cool. Well, the little emblem up there, you see the gold emblem. That's Bitcoin. And if you're not familiar with Bitcoin, um, I'm not going to sit here and say I'm a Bitcoin expert, but basically sure. it's, a, it's, a, it's a way for people to pay for services and that kind of thing. And it's actually been incorporated into the, uh, the bad world, so to speak, because it's hard to trace who actually you're paying. And the little servers that you see up there, the little computers where the lines are squiggly through there, when the ransomware is released, and if you were to say, okay, I'm going to pay you this, um, to, uh, in this particular case, I can't remember how many Bitcoin it was, but it was, it wasn't, it wasn't huge, but it wasn't, it was, uh, it hurt. Um, is if you pay, if you agree to pay the Bitcoin or pay Bitcoin, 
you, you have to open an account and do all these steps. And then through what they call a Tor network, it basically is hopping from server to server to server. And while the bad guy may be sitting in Atlanta, Georgia, it looks like he's in Paris, France. So finding him is going to be almost next to impossible. So in that's the two components of ransomware. Is they're going to lock your devices down, and then the payment method is so obfuscated, all the connected mm -hmm. pieces, there's no way to ever really find out who it is. And are we looking and at an example of, of one of those uh, cases that you know about? Yeah, going back to the to the root of the problem here, and I hate to keep picking on people, but that's that's where it was. Is not only did somebody open an email that they shouldn't have opened, and there's telltale signs, and I can tell you about those. But there's telltale signs that'll say, "Hey, this something's not right with this email." That not only did they open it, but the machine that you see, where the little, the guy with the lock to the side of him, he's he's an authorized user, right? Mm -hmm. Well, these control system front ends, I've seen it time and time and time again, where they're sitting on a building engineer's desk, out in the public. Anybody, and they're using this thing to look at Facebook, to look at their, check their mail, whatever the case. And this is the thing that's controlling the building. But yet, people are using it for whatever they want to. Because, and, it, and there's no restriction to access. Well, so what happened was, this person opened the email on the control system, front end. <clears throat> the bad guys didn't, they didn't know what it was. All they cared about was getting their money. But to the, but to the people that this happened to, it blinded them to their control system. It, they, everything inside that machine was now encrypted. But server three is exceptionally nasty because it doesn't encrypt, encrypt folders. It can encrypts individual files with individual encryption keys. So if you have a million files, that's a million encryption keys. And it would take billions of years to figure out <laughs> what the encryption, <laughs> encryption wow. keys were. Wow. So there's no way. Yeah. Plus, it, it did one other thing. It started uh, deleting shadow copies. And shadow copies are shot copies that are, you know, recoverable copies that you could pull, pull back into place. Now, this particular company, uh, they didn't pay the ransomware, but it took them days to figure this out. And what they had to do is eventually wipe the machine clean and they found some backups that they had made months ago. And they put it in place and everything's back up and running, but all that data is gone. It's, it's, it's never coming back. Yeah. Now, there's one aspect didn't happen to them, and I added this layer so people will be aware, is if you'll notice the red lines that are going over to the little data cans and the server rack. Well, what could happen, or could have happened in this case, if this machine had access rights to any servers on the corporate network, it could have prop server three could have propagated itself not only on the control system, but throughout the rest of the network. And then now what you've got is that every machine or at least every every uh, server that you have in your system is now encrypted. In that case, you might have to play the ransomware because you know by the time, I mean, who knows how long you would be down. Yeah. Um, but that's a, that's a distinct possibility, and all of this results, are the, these results that I've spoke of, come from people. So we need to look at something real quick, if you can uh, sure. indulge me. So first off, the control system is uh, like the goat in um, Jurassic Park. <laughs> the goat was on a stake, right? I mean, it can't defend itself. There's just no way, and the control system. When I've heard people kind of yelling back at the manufacturer and yelling back at this and all that, the control system is not designed to protect itself, just like the goat is not. So what you got to do is you either got to get the goat out of the pen or you got to get the T-Rex out of the pen, but you got to separate them somehow. Yeah. And you have to, in order to do that, you got to get that control system inside the IT bubble. Once it's inside the IT bubble, you're going to have to change the way you do things, and it's typically uh, it's typical for a control system vendor to have a back door into your system. And, and it was done not for uh, any illegitimate means. It was done just like with the mechanical contracts that I work with. We had 400 service guys on the road. And so any one of them could go to a building and fix it. Well, 
if um, so, what that meant is every system that this company service had a single username and password in there for the uh, for their service guys to go in and work on it. Well, that's convenient, and I get that, but that can't exist anymore because all it takes is one of those guys to get mad, get fired, and hand that username and password off to somebody. The other thing is uh, because there's been such a detachment from IT and OT, what has happened is over the years is the facility guys have contracted with the integrator, hey, build me a network, and while you're at it, build me remote access. And so the person that, remote, that owns all the remote access is not the building owner, but the integrator. And again, that's bad IT practices. No IT, comp no IT group is ever going to allow that. But we've created that all for the sake of convenience. Yeah, Fred, you know, that's got me thinking, and you and I were discussing uh, before launching uh, this conversation, you know, the data is searchable, and it's quite scary to think of about what's so freely available online. Then there are programs um, which are also f freely available online, which you can use to, to take over the devices. And then it's not that hard to go from taking over the device to gaining access to the network, which is what we're looking what we're looking at here. And so one of the questions I had for you early on was, you know, how did we get here? Well, one of the things that uh, we, we need to establish right off the bat was how do you go back to your customer and say, hey, by the way, we, we have set you up and made you pretty vulnerable. It's a hard, that's a hard conversation to have. But the realization is when OT started out, now you're looking at these two triangles here. The left side is IT, the right side is OT. And these are principles that have been developed by ICS CERT, but they are foundationally, to me, the easiest way to explain things. In the IT realm, the first and foremost thing that's important is information confidentiality. And that means that, you know, we're going to protect it first and we're going to worry about the other functions, second and third. The second function is the integrity of the data. The data has got to be right, but again, it's second to the confidentiality. I'm going to say no to you first before I give you access, and then I'm going to figure out, do you really need access? Then what you do, I'm going to, as an IT manager, make sure that the data is correct and up to date and everything's available or there. And then availability. That's that piece where I finally say as an IT guy, okay, you have the rights to see this, but nobody else does. In OT, availability is the highest hallmark that we have to go for. And why is that? That is because control systems are, are machine to machine communication. And th decisions inside of programs are being made in milliseconds. And so therefore, it's, it's paramount that nothing impede that, that communication between devices and between the devices that they control. So availability <clears throat> is number one. Number two is integrity, because in the integrity of the data and the integrity of the system gives the operators real-time vision into their systems to see if they, they've got a problem that's developing, and they can look at archival data, and they look at real-time data, and they say, okay, well, I'm seeing something that's trending bad, so I'm going to go take care of it. And confidentiality is, <clears throat> in, in this particular triangle, I'm showing it like ICS CERT does, but sometimes when I do talks, I pull confidentiality over to the side. As it's just broken away from the piece because that is so far removed from the, the, the principles and the thought process behind putting together a control system strategy <clears throat> and network. I kind of touched on a little bit of history. That's the kind of the high level of the high end view, the ICS CERT view. So let's look real quick back in the uh, history of control systems. Sure. Control systems started out as pneumatic systems. And then electronic uh, control, DDC, came into existence. And that was just a series of ands, ors, and logic, and that kind of thing that just happened to make things happen based on this condition. If this happens and this happens, then do this. Mm -hmm. Well, then now that we're the microprocessor-based control, what happened was, is the integrator now had to learn IT. He had to learn how to run Cat5 cable, not just serial cable. He had to learn how to 
set up uh, inner IP addresses, subnets, domains, all of that. But he only needed to do as much as he needed to do to allow the devices to talk to each other and the humans to talk to the devices. And that's where it ended. And again, <clears throat> and this is not picking on a building operator, but that's not their forte either. What they are is they're highly gifted individuals that know how to do things with a 300-ton chiller that I'll never be able to do because I don't understand the deep mechanics of it. Sure. But so when they got these systems that were supposed to make their life easier, in some cases they made them, <laughs> it made it a little bit more complicated. So the integrator stepped in and said, let me help you because we're putting these in. We're going to add your users, and the building engineers would say, hey, look, I just need one user for all of us to use. Okay, boom, 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 do it. The integrator, like I said earlier, ha may have a team of guys that come out there, and you can imagine if you're an integrator and you've got a 1,000 systems out there and you've got 50 employees, that all they do is service these thousands of systems, and if each one of them had a unique username and password, just the apt, actual headache of being able to keep up all of that, all that information together is overwhelming. And so that's how we got to the point where we had single users for both engineering and for the, the vendor. And then the next step was is once the guys realized, hey, if I'm in a computer room with 50th floor, I can see my control system. It would really be really nice that on the weekend I could get to that control system if an alarm happens, so I didn't have to drive an hour to get to the, to the site because it makes sense. Right. Because I could get to, I could do something before something blew up. Yep. So going back to the integrator, the integrator's not an IT firm. That's not their forte. They're integration specialists. But what they did is they, we've got Best Buy routers sitting out. I'm not picking on Best Buy, but I'm just saying there's Best Buy routers that are sitting out there with little home VPN or the next worst thing, or the uh, much more worst thing, is you can get a public IP from your internet service provider, and you can stick that in the front end of your machine, and there's nothing between it and the World Wide Web. All I got to do is put in that public IP and get challenged for that single username and password that we all know, and that gets us in the door. Mm -hmm. So that's how we got here. Fred, is this gap bridgeable? Yes, it is but not without some discomfort. And now I say that, I don't want to make it sound like it's an uh, insurmountable task. There are some basic things that everybody can do. First off is NIST set up a framework, and this is publicly available information. I will say it's a dry read, and it's a lot of stuff there. Uh, I've read all of them, and it'll put you to sleep pretty quick. And that's the National <laughs> but, Institute of Science and Technology. Is that right? That's correct. But um, they've done a good job of creating a uh, generic cybersecurity framework. They've also created things that are specific to control systems. Now, the control systems they're talking about are power grid, oil and gas, and that kind of thing. And it, it fits our world about 75%, 80%. But anyway, so the very first thing you got to do is, um, I would say, take a look at this. But these five principles right here, is the foundation of the NIST cybersecurity framework. Identify. What that means is know what's on your network because I can guarantee you, I've seen this time and time again, I call it network drift, is once a vendor has turned it over to you in a year's time, two years' time, there's a drift of 20 30%, meaning people have plugged up additional things that shouldn't be there. So you need to take stock of your inventory, stock, whatever you want to call it, of your control system network. Find out everything that's attached. Protect. That means is if you have any exposures, whether it be through a public IP or you have a, a consumer-grade VPN or you have a printer that's been plugged up that's accessible by other people or cameras, whatever the case may be, you need to take those and get them inside the IT bubble. Detect. Now, this is... a uh, this is a difficult one for most people. Uh, I will say this first before we go to detect. If you do step one and two, to me it's a lot like uh, putting the sign out in front of your yard in your neighborhood. 
-hmm. where somebody's driving through and they're looking, they say, well, there's an alarm system on that house, there's an alarm system on that house, oh, well, here's one that's empty, or doesn't have an alarm system. So if you do that, the, the very first two, if you do that, guess what? Census, Shodan, Zuma is not going to see you. And if they don't see you, the bad guys are probably not going to see you. Okay? <clears throat> now, now moving on to detect. Got it, yep. This, this is a, um, well, the reason I say it's hard is because it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause OT and IT to begin to have conversations, which we need to have them anyway. We need to start those now. It's, okay, I have this system system and we've done all these steps and we've gotten it protected. We've identified everything, we've protected it. We put in change management, meaning I can't plug anything into my network unless I let somebody know. Uh, and in the detection piece of that, if you have this piece in part in place, if somebody were to plug something onto your network and it wasn't it hadn't been authorized or whatever, the detection would pick that up and you would be able to maintain uh, your network architecture 100%, but then you would also be able to detect things like physical security intrusions, which we didn't talk about, but basically that just means there's a generator in the parking lot, and I unplug from the generator, and I plug my laptop in, boom, and now I'm in the network. So there are, I mean, we have some, we work with some people that have detection software and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. there, there are more and more coming about, but it's still, still got a little ways to go. And then respond. This is something that most most in the building control side have never really thought about. Is uh, if an attack happens, let's use um, Target for example. The company that I referred to, mm -hmm. they're almost out of business now. It wasn't their. I don't want to say it wasn't their fault, but it really more of the onus is on Target than it would have been on them. But their damage to their brand is insurmountable. And that's the other thing I tell people is wh whether the bad guy steals something from you or somebody sues you at the core, if your brand is no longer good, what does it matter? Because you don't have customers. So you need to learn how to, to respond internally and externally, and you can't put your head in the sand and pretend that it will go away. Uh, I'm sure you remember the uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield or Anthem breach. Do you, That's right. you know, do you remember that one? It happened not long after Target, right? Who do they talk about the most now? Target. The reason they're not talking about Anthem as much is because within 24 hours, the president of the company uh, sent an email out, letters out, to every subscriber telling them what they were going to do. Nothing came out from the company that was the HVAC mechanical uh, service people from for Target, and Target delayed their response. Home Depot had a breach. Which one do you hear of more still? Target. Home Depot responded. So you got you got to identify people inside your organization that are going <clears> to <throat> come to the forefront and basically take charge of this situation and be the vehicle for public relations and that kind of thing. But then also. What do you do internally? Do you pull plugs off the wall? Do you shut things down? And then recover. I mean, once you've done all of these things, your recovery is making sure that you get all your data back in place, making sure that your relationship with your customers are mended, and uh, then take a, a, a forensic look at what, you, what happened, how I can prevent it in the future, and uh, move on from there. But if you... I mean, to me, those five principles is what everybody needs to live by. Uh, this is this is a this is not just a career for me; it's become a passion. And there's a lot that we've got to get done. And I know it can be scary uh, when you sit back and think of your budgetary concerns and that kind of thing. There is a lot of lo low-hanging fruit that you can do that's not going to cost you a ton of money. Um, but anyway. I just uh, I want to appreciate uh, say thank you to you, Millen, you guys for letting me come on and uh, talk about this subject. I appreciate you taking the time uh, to chat with us about BMS hacks and cybersecurity in the built environment. And so thank you very much, Fred. Thank you. Okay, that's a wrap. 
For more episodes, go to the Gridium blog online or subscribe to Finely Tuned wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. And thanks to the artist BOPD for the music today. For the music today. For the music today. For the music today. For the music today.